Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Helix Mattresses. If you go to helixsleep.com slash holly and take their two-minute online quiz, they will match you to the perfect customizable mattress made just for you. And if you order with my code holly, you get $200 off plus free pillows. So go to helixsleep.com slash holly to get $200 off plus two free pillows. Okay, so let's welcome my guest today. Today I have Caitlin Bailey. She is a podcaster, a sex worker advocate, and she's going to school us on all the things surrounding sex work, the stigma, what is decriminalization, um, what is International Whores Day, so many things to talk about. So Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am I'm thrilled to talk about my favorite topic. Uh, fantastic. Mine, mine too. Now, before we get into all these important things that we need to discuss, I need to know what the fuck that is on the wall behind you. Oh, that's a really great question. Uh, this is <laughs> art. Um, this is uh, art made of wool. This is this is craft, uh, and it, it's available on Etsy. So it is, this is wool well, art. It's a tapestry, well, well, and it's... <laughs> I see that, but like, what? Okay, so for those of you guys who are not watching the YouTube version... I don't, um, know, I, I don't know that I have my camera set up to see the oh no shot actually here. I'll have to I'll have to give folks oh. a, sh- a a look at what it is that we're talking yeah. about this monstrosity. It makes because... me it makes me feel like the devil in the Devil's Advocate. You know when like they mm-hmm. go to his office and the the walls are that disconcerting uh, sculpture. So that's. Uh-huh. That's the so, aesthetic. So it's not for. anything like specific. It's kind of like whatever I imagine it to be. Cause like it looks like maggots, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Maybe no, there's it's... definitely like a worm or um, I've also heard intestines. That's something that comes mm. up for, for a lot of people. Uh it feels like an ecosystem. Could be roots, you know? Could be yeah. uh could be uh the underworld, could be wrestling ghosts, uh, you know, just something off putting uh and dark, you know. <laughs> Did, no, did you make this? No, of course not. Uh, oh. No, this was this was an Etsy purchase, and we were we were looking for something, you know, because we, as a fellow podcaster, right, like soft mm-hmm. things on the wall is uh, is a positive yes. thing. So we were looking for. Uh, we knew that we wanted a tapestry, um, and then we were looking at a bunch of stuff online, and this was the the most interesting um, thing. But we've been living with it for for a minute now. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. It's really, it's intense, but it's, you know, it's unique and it's clearly a conversation starter. So, sure, you know, I'm in my uh, daylight studio. I just have a white wall behind me. So, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe we could suggest that like my art is, you know, those, those artists that sell like a blank canvas for like $25,000 and it's like, you know, yes. it's whatever yes. you imagine is on there. So that's my art. It's just... Whatever you want to imagine That's, back there. I um I'm a I'm a I have a cluttered mind and I prefer a cluttered studio. Um mm-hmm. so I am I'm somebody who likes to I like hanging things and you know art that's that's crammed and, and cramped up and we consulted with an interior designer that was like, oh, that's going to make the face, the space feel uh, cluttered and off-putting. And I was like, that is exactly the kind of studio atmosphere that I'm trying to create. Other people <laughs> should feel uncomfortable here. <laughs> oh my god well i mean we definitely your podcast definitely does cover some <laughs> uncomfortable subjects for uh-huh. some people so your podcast is called the oldest profession um and can you explain to our audience what you mean by that and specifically what topics does your show explore yeah so the the mission of the podcast is to sort of reclaim our history because sex workers have always been a part of the story we're we're everywhere we're in every civilization um and we've been players in you know massive world events and so all the our fo- um our podcast focuses on a figure from history that either engaged in sex work or was maligned as a sex worker um and we tell their story and we try to contextualize them in 
their own time and pull lessons that might be useful to contemporary sex worker rights advocates that are very much still fighting for our voices and stories to be heard. So who is perhaps your favorite figure that you've covered? Or maybe the most recognizable to people? I, well, those are, those are different. Um, one of my favorite figures from history is, uh, is Veronica Franco, who was a, um, a poet in, um, you know, the sort of Renaissance, um, uh, you know, she was a Venetian, uh, poet. Um, and she, she was a very famous and accomplished author at a time during a period of history in a place where it was illegal for women of her class to, to read or access the public library. But there was an exception that was made to courtesans for reasons that we, that we go into um, in the podcast. And she was an unapologetic advocate uh, for women in her, of her class and station. Um, and she is one of many, many voices that we try to elevate and reconsider and reexamine um, on the podcast, because I think that we all would have been better served if, um, you know, Venetian politicians um, and the the elites of the period had listened to Veronica Franco um, over their other advisors. You know, I think that we would be living in a more compassionate world today. It's interesting when you look at courtesans from that time period, because like you said, they are unusually educated versus, you know, women who are of the upper class. Yes. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, I think that there's a you know, there's a long history behind the the division of the you know Madonna whore. Uh, you know, a, a lot of biblical scholars you sort of go back into history and look at the archetypes that um, that the Bible is sort of reconfiguring. Um, Ishtar is a, a very old goddess. She is uh, the goddess of love and war from the ancient Babylonian Empire. And the legend is that she was born a virgin every morning and she went to bed a whore every night. And so these uh, you know supposed Supposed opposites are, you know, contained in the body of, of one deity. Um, and as, you know, any person who was once a virgin and is not anymore, this can be, you know, you can be these things in, in one lifetime. But the, you know, the Bible, we divide uh, this into the two Marys, right? The Virgin Mother and then Mary Magdalene uh, that sort of occupy those, those archetypal places. Um, we see this again with, uh, with the story of Genesis. You know, Eve is... Um, of Adam, right, of Adam's rib, uh, so his sort of like daughter wife, um, naive enough to, to fall for the snake oil salesman. But an earlier version of Genesis talks about Adam's first wife, Lilith, who was made from, you know, the same clay as Adam and refused to submit to him, specifically during sex, but like probably during the rest of the time too. And, you know, for this, she she left the garden and was was sort of demonized. But I I think that, you know, during the Renaissance, during the the period of time where the, the Holy Roman Empire is the governing body throughout Europe, the idea of women um, pursuing their own intellectual uh, ideas or becoming well-educated was, uh, you know, an invitation to the devil. There's a whole genre of literature uh, written during this period about why women are like so susceptible to sin. So do courtesans have a kind of freedom and autonomy that other women didn't have? Like, could they own property? Yes, absolutely. Could they make money? Yes. Yes. And, and this is something that you see that like really doesn't start to, uh, go away until the, until the Protestant Reformation, um, until uh, the Catholic Church suddenly starts to, to compete um, with the, the moral authority uh, with, you know, with, another, with another group. But until then, you know, the Catholic Church is the largest brothel owner in Europe. And what happens is that when a woman embraces the identity of whore or sex worker, that allows her to free herself from some of the, the what would be required if chastity um, was the the metric of, of her social value, right? So whether you are the daughter of, you know, somebody of their classes or the wife, you protecting your virginity and your, uh, your reputation is your connection to social status. Courtesans, because they have freed themselves from being, um, you know, the property of one man, uh, they're allowed to move freely, they're allowed to be educated, they're allowed to make dirty jokes. Um, you know, sex workers have been in social spaces that women have been excluded from uh, for thousands and thousands of years. 
Isn't it so interesting though, like how in both cases, like a woman's sexuality is a commodity. Yes. You know, on one hand you want to remain a virgin and, and it is this prize that you hold on to and you sell to the highest bidder, you know, yes. whoever's willing to marry you. And then on the other hand, you're, you're selling it to various people, but you're retaining your own independence as well. It's just like, I always find that so interesting. You know, when people talk about like, oh, you sell your body for a living. I'm like, we kind of- No, I'm not a coal miner. We kind of all do. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, I'm sorry. My dad was uh, in the army for 30 years. I'd love to get into that. Yeah. 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 It's different. I mean, that's, that's- He's literally thing, selling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what made you so interested in uh, sex work specifically? Did you, have you worked in that? Um, I have. Yeah. I felt, I felt called to this work. I feel, um, which I know is, is unusual. And I don't think that, you know, that needs to be true for, for people to uh, enjoy human rights and dignity while, while doing this work, even if it's not uh, their life's mission. But I came to sex work from a place of economic security and intellectual curiosity when I was, when I was very young, I was 17 and a half. Uh, which is the same age that my father was when he joined the army. Um, but I, I started seeing clients in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I did that for about two years. Um, and then I left sex work uh, to, you know, go to college. And um, I sort of thought that I had, I had sated my curiosity, um, you know, and challenged the, the cultural narrative that uh, any sex that I engaged in or was done to me would, uh, you know, deflate me like a balloon or something. Uh, you know, abstinence only education is full of a lot of weird ideas. Um, and I, I went to college, I graduated, I worked in campaigns, uh, and then I got into stand up comedy. And so I came back to sex work, this time in New York City, uh, to subsidize and support my artistic ambitions. And it's, you know, my, my sex work is what's made my, yeah, my creative pursuits possible. Yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've talked to so many girls in the industry on this podcast, obviously, specifically. And, you know, for me, um, I always want to advocate for sex workers just, I mean, because I work in the industry, but, you know, having been in this industry for over 20 years, I just, you know, we're like a community and sex workers are some of the most magical, intelligent, yeah. funny, wonderful people. Like they're just, you know, and, and, and the, idea that people have about sex workers is just so flawed in so many cases. Yeah. But what I, what I do love is especially with the, you know, proliferation of the new like personal content platforms, like the only fans, sex workers are making yeah. so much money on their own now in a way that they weren't before. And now so many of them are using it to like subsidize other, yes. um, other creative pursuits. I mean, I was talking, I saw Adriana Chechik the other day who is going to come on this podcast, by the way, I finally talked to her. I'm going to get her on, but she's like the, all these hobbies that she's engaging in. She's like learning how to, I forgot what it's called. There's a specific term for it, but she's basically teaching herself how to like walk a tightrope and like do tricks on it. And she just does that because she's like, I have money and it's something I've always wanted to try. And so like, I'm going to do it. And it's so cool to see. Yeah. And it's so cool to see, you know, these people be able to make enough, um, work in the sex work industry. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to take up all of your time. It's not a nine to five job and you can go and follow all of these other pursuits and interests. And it's just really cool to see that happen. I, and I think it really speaks to and and gets at the heart of uh, everyone's problem with sex work, right? Which is that mm. engaging in sex work gives women freedom of movement and purchasing power. And that is an existential threat to patriarchal control. I, sex workers have, have, uh, have enjoyed or had access to or been able to carve out a level of freedom that was aggressively and violently denied to the vast majority of women. And they did so at the expense, right, that they they took on this stigma, right, which often also led to other kinds of violence or other kinds of limitations. Um, You know, we've been working very, very hard as a society to punish prostitutes, right? To punish uh, women or non-binary people or non-conforming people that take this path. And it's fascinating to me because we bring so much good in the world, you know, on on top of just the, the job itself, right? Of like, you know, making people come for a living. 
all of this other stuff that you're talking about, right? Subsidizing um, creative hobbies. I'm so impressed with the work at a magazine called Petite Mort, right? Which is a high fashion magazine by and for sex workers, right? Spread Magazine and the legacy of that. Like sex workers um, use not only our, our creative energy and and the capital that we that we get from doing this work to invest in artistic communities. And I think that's that's beautiful. And it's a thing that's been true for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned, um, prostitution and like the punishment mm-hmm. of prostitution. Can you, now there's been some movement around decriminalizing sex work. Can you explain yes. to those who don't, who may not know, there's a difference between legalizing prostitution and decriminalizing prostitution. And what is that difference and why might one be more preferable than the other for sex workers? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm I'm happy to get into it. Thank you so much for asking because it's one of the, you, you know, one of the, there are a lot of people that are with us on these issues that, you know, they're, they're coming from a really good place when they want to create worker protections, right? Where they want to create regulatory systems with this idea that they're going to, going to help the girls. But the, you know, decriminalizing sex work stops the arrests, right? It means that engaging in consensual sexual services, uh, you know, engaging in erotic services in exchange for money or something of value is not a crime, right? And that's the place that we want to get to. And I think it's the best way to think about it is through the LGBTQ umbrella, right? When there was a was a long period of our history where engaging in homosexual acts was a was a crime. Uh, and there were many periods of time where people were aggressively policed for, you know, for engaging in, in sodomy or being seen dancing with somebody of the same sex or dressing outside of their, outside of their gender. When we decriminalized homosexuality, we didn't create like a new bureaucratic system where like, if you want to engage in homosexual acts, you have to like fill out a form or, you know, talk to a bureaucrat. That's not, that's not the future that we we recreated. And that's what would happen under legalization. And I think it's important to remember that legalization creates a new legal structure through which to, to govern um, sex workers. And, you know, we don't have to imagine what the system looks like. We have a really good example. Nevada is the only state in the union with legal regulated prostitution. And it also has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution. Why might that be? Well, most people don't want to work in a brothel. Uh, You know, the overwhelming majority of the sex trade in Nevada happens outside of these tightly regulated brothels that, you know, where decades of horphobic legislation has really tipped the scale in favor of of management. Um, You know, if you are a sex worker and you would like to work as a legal prostitute in Nevada, you better hope that you've never been arrested for prostitution before because that is disqualifying. Uh, If you want to work in a brothel, you have to register as a sex worker with the local sheriff. That becomes a subpoenable fact about you for the rest of your life. So you better hope that you and your domestic partner stay happily married because because if not, then they can take your children away because the stigma around sex work is such that if it comes to light that you worked as a legal registered prostitute in Nevada, then you can be deemed an unfit mother. When you work, uh, if you're hired at a legal brothel, and you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, they certainly prefer cisgendered, traditionally attractive, uh, privileged, privileged people. So there are folks that are not eligible to work in the brothel, not because of a criminal background, but, um, and of course, you know, undocumented immigrants. Um, so anyway, if you are hired to work in a brothel, you work 12 to 24 hour shifts. You have mandatory SDI testing that is publicly available. So you don't enjoy the same, uh, the same rights. You immediately become a second class citizen. And in fact, you are not allowed to leave the premises of the brothels in many of the counties in Nevada and just have a drink at a bar nearby. Most of the the regulatory energy has been directed not at protecting workers and making their experience better, but rather from protecting communities from the infectious sex workers uh, that they they want to contain uh, in their their brothel or red light district. So, um, you know, my news to to listeners is that you you are already living um, in a society and in a place and in a community where 
all kinds of people are already having all kinds of sex all around you. And I think that if we could all just get a little bit more comfortable with that idea, then we would stop pursuing um, sort of silly regulatory schemes that end up disempowering the people that we claim to want to help. Yeah. And if any of you guys are interested in learning more about what it's like to work in brothels and the process, which Caitlin just described, you can listen to my podcast with Charlotte Sart, um, with Alice Little, or with Kimberly Kane. Um, they've all worked in brothels, and they do a pretty good job of explaining yeah. what it's like. And um, yeah, I remember specifically the mention of not being allowed to leave the premises for yeah. these shifts, um, which was surprising mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, it's creepy. You know, and so, and I, you know, I, I worked as an independent escort and I, I think that like any, any kind of, uh, regulatory scheme that prevents individual people from deciding that they want to do sex work one day and like meeting somebody at a bar or putting up an ad on, you know, someplace where, where that's allowed and, and meeting with somebody and exchanging money. I reject licensing uh, schemes. I reject mandatory STI testing. All of those create regulatory barriers that end up creating a two-tiered system, right? So if you're a sex worker um, and you didn't fill out your paperwork, right, or you're a sex worker and you're working outside of the legal system and you are violently raped or you come across or you're a witness of a crime, under legalization, you can't report that to the police. You have no legal protections because the work that you're doing is still criminalized. Um, And in the case of Nevada, aggressively criminalized. Right. So even, so then the idea is that like, if you're doing it under these rules and regulations, it's legal. But if you're doing it outside of that, it's illegal, which you can get prosecuted for. But if we simply decriminalized it, then nobody would be prosecuted for however they went about their business. Yeah, and that's, you know, because sex work is work, but it is also sex. And I think it's really important that we talk about like regulatory schemes that anything that applies to sex workers is going to apply to the, the to everyone in the country, right? Because so we really don't want to create reasons or excuses for police officers to like, I don't know, arrest people uh, for making the wrong kind of eye contact. You know, we want to do we want to do less of that. And so I think that thinking of sex work as as a kind of sex uh, in addition to a form of work and putting it under sort of the LGBTQ umbrella, we shouldn't be arresting people uh, for any kind of consensual sex that they engage in, whether money is exchanged or not. And the exchange of money should not criminalize uh, an otherwise perfectly legal sex act. Right. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about um, sex work in politics and is that changing and a lot more. So hang around. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, guys, we are back. So Caitlin, can you tell us about the changing perspectives on sex work in the political spectrum? Um, You know, first we see AOC uh, tweeting sex work is work, which Mm -hmm. was like such an astounding thing for me to see. 
Um, so good. That was, yeah. I mean, that was amazing. Um, and now we're seeing that sex workers have gained the backing of like a small group of democratic mm-hmm. lawmakers, I think specifically around the SESTA Foster yes. bill, which, you know, sex workers weren't really given any kind of voice in the drafting. So maybe could you explain what that bill is and tell us why it's harmful for sex workers? Absolutely. I I will say this, though, that I feel like sex workers have been the Cassandras of history for a long time, just screaming about the sort of obvious and inevitable consequences um, of legislation that always seems to take legislators by surprise. Uh, So I do want to say that it's not that sex workers weren't, uh, you know, we were certainly not consulted on the legislation, but uh, we told people what was going to happen before it went down. And then like the last hundred times we've done this, we were right. So SESTA-FOSTA was sold to the American public as a way to crack down on child sexual exploitation, which is a horrible crime that absolutely deserves more attention and resources than it's getting. But what they tried to do, instead of going after uh, folks that that attack children or folks that exploit children, they tried to erase sex workers from the internet, uh, which has been something that the conservatives and sort of the puritanical, uh, I don't know, thread um, in U.S. politics has been trying to do for for a long time. This goes way back to the, you know, the 1870s and and the, absent, you know, Anthony Comstock's obscenity laws, right, where he uh, defined pornography and defined obscenity as medically accurate uh, medical information, birth control, or information about women's bodies. So this sort of like willful misunderstanding of the relationship between, uh, you know, censorship and, uh, you know, trying to there's just a certain type of dude that like thinks that like titties are a national emergency and like something that we need to rescue our children from. And like, I don't know, you know, and and that's just been happening for a long time. So technology changes, but people really don't. And so the internet has been a place that has really opened up a lot of possibilities for sex workers to schedule and screen their own clients, to free themselves from third parties, whether they be madams or brothel owners or pimps. Um, and, And, you know, sex workers were kind of thriving in the early 2000s, um, in, you know, in 2010. Uh, but on April 11th, 2018, Donald Trump signed sesta Foster into law. A uh, back page was seized by the FBI. Craigslist Erotic Services was shuttered. Rent Boy was shuttered. Uh, and a, a lot of places that sex workers had been using, adult consensual sex workers, had been using to connect with clients and advertise their services in a place where it wouldn't bother other people um, were erased. And so the immediate after effects of that are that you saw sex workers um, flooding to the street. There was a huge uptick um, in street solicitation. Uh, There was a huge uptick in sex workers uh, going on to dating sites that are not designed for us, right? So you see, which of course inspires more community complaints. A lot of sex workers... uh, lost their housing, people were thrown into economic desperation, and being forced to do more for less. And all of that happened before the pandemic. But it was also a radicalizing movement within the sex worker rights world. You know, because sex workers had been able to apply their trade under the radar, right, because many sex workers had been able to to work without detection, um, there wasn't a lot of movement solidarity. The people that were being harassed by the police... um, it were were ones that were doing uh, street-based sex work. But sesta Fosta, I think, united the movement, uh, gave us a rallying cry, and has led to some very aggressive and successful lobbying campaigns across the country where sex workers are demanding a seat at the table. They're asking uh, for meetings with legislators, and in many cases, they are being heard. How do you see the future of sex work in the political process? Like, do you think that there... That- that sex workers will have a voice in legislation. I mean, do you see the possibility of sex workers even being elected to, you know, political office? I mean, Stormy Daniels ran for Senate in Louisiana in like 2004 or something, you know, bananas like that. But, uh, you know, I, so I, 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 I resist the temptation to talk about, um, you know, a, a sort of sea change 
shift in in trends. Uh, I think it's important to point out that sex workers, you know, have always been telling our story, uh, you know, going back to you know, 1913, 1917, Victoria Woodhall was a sex worker and she ran for president in 1870. You know, so sex workers have always been putting themselves out there. But I, I do feel like we are we are being heard uh, by legislators and maybe for the, the first time in, in our history. Um, I know that there are, you know, there are several legislators here in New York that are running uh, for a variety of different offices, you know, from mayor to DA to, um, you know, district president on an explicit platform of full decriminalization of sex work and are actually uh, pushing back against things like the Nordic model or end demand that that kind of clarity uh, would have been unimaginable just, you know, two, four years ago. So I'm really, really thrilled with um, it, the legislators that are not only listening, but doing a really, really good job of getting our message and getting our arguments into uh, into legislative spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the, the term sex worker wasn't around when I first started in the adult industry. And so even just the advent of that name and watching the advocacy that has really taken a foothold, like in social media yes, and, and seeing the way that sex workers are really rallying around unfair biases and practices yeah. towards them has been, it's been amazing. And I think what's so something that, that gives me hope, uh, you know, in my, in my moments where, um, you know, I feel like we're going to uh, succumb to legalization or the Amazonification of sex work or some dystopian nightmare of, you know, uh, client criminalization is that sex workers have been isolated from each other um, under, you know, a system of stigma and criminalization for a really long time. And the internet has allowed us to connect with each other. And even after pieces of legislation like SESTA-FOSTA and all of the efforts to erase erotic content from the internet, we are still finding ways to connect with each other, share our stories, and that empowers all of us to take those stories into uh, the rest of our communities. You know, coming out to my family, uh, sitting in front of legislators, doing press conferences, none of that would have been possible had I not find, not had I not found solidarity and community, which I found online. God, yeah, that's so true. I kind of didn't think about it that way, but of course, yeah. I mean, finally, like sex workers have a platform to talk to each other and support each other yeah. and educate each other. And that's really important to hold on to. And that's why it, it, it you know, something I, I fear the future of the surveillance state. You know, I, I look at what, um, what is possible in places like China and I look at some of the more authoritarian instincts that we have in, in our own surveillance system. And this conflation of adult consensual sex work with the horrific um, and very, you know, emotionally triggering crime of child sex trafficking isn't taking us anywhere good. You know, we're not, we're not saving a lot of sex slaves. We're not rescuing a lot of children, but we are ruining the lives of a lot of people who are engaged in this work. And that does not make them less susceptible to exploitation. That's not what arrests yeah. do. You know, what I think of when you say that, I think about that Nicholas Kristoff article in the New York Times against Pornhub. And, um, you know, my friend and journalist Gustavo Turner calling his piece emotional pornography yes. yeah. because of the way that it really, you know, kind of pulled at your heartstrings and, and mm -hmm. centering it around this idea of all these exploited children, which of course everybody, you know, is horrified by that idea and yeah. using that as a kind of platform for, um, you know, advocating against all sex work. And it's, it, it comes from a place of paternalism. And that's why I think it's so important for, you know, people that identify as feminists not to fall for this idea that, like, women are like a special childlike subspecies of women, right? This goes back to the Eve myth. But, you know, in Texas, just last week, uh, Governor Abbott signed a bill that fired every 18, 19, and 20-year-old stripper in the state, right? Because mm -hmm. they they thought that stripping is, yeah, if you are under the age of 21, 
you can't handle it. And I will tell you that uh, as somebody who engaged in sex work as a as a very young person, um, you know, being fired from my job as a stripper, if I was a single mom or had bills to pay, would not have led me to, uh, I don't know, a retail job. I'm, I'm more likely to be pushed into the criminal element of this work. I'm more likely to uh, engage in full service sex work, um, you know, allowing strip clubs, um, it, it, allowing, you know, it, women are legal adults at 18, just like men. If you can join the army at 17 and a half, 18 years old, then you ought to be able to dance for money. I feel like we've we've put a lot of emotional weight um, around our sort of the, the the caricature of what it means to engage in, in sex work. And we've lost the thread a little bit. Like there's there's a criminality associated with strip clubs. A lot of that has to do with zoning laws and like the way that, uh, you know, strip clubs are, are sort of regulated and controlled. But, you know, how much energy is it really a national security issue that there are people out there uh, in fluorescent thongs um, exchanging, you know, narcissistic supply for dollars. Is that really like the highest policing priority in the state of Texas? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was waiting for you to make that association with the ability to join the army. At I actually didn't know you could join at seventeen and a half. I thought it was eighteen. I mean, my um, my father joined at at seventeen. Uh, he tried to join at sixteen, and the recruitment officer, uh, you know, brought him back to his mother essentially. But at at seventeen, um, he was allowed to follow through with the paperwork. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, you we have to kind of make up our mind of when we consider someone to be an adult. You can't make an exception for the adult industry. You know, when you can go. Essentially, you can, we're you gonna can go to war for your country. Yeah, yeah. And you can die for your country, mm-hmm. but like, it's just, I don't know. But then, you know, I, I do also talk to a lot of porn stars who got into the industry at a young age and some of them did really well and made good mm-hmm. decisions and some of them did not. And some of them said, you know, I would, I wish I would have waited until mm. later. And in those cases, I just wonder if perhaps there was just better resources yeah. um, and information for people to explore regarding getting into sex work. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And I, I, I think about that a lot when, um, you know, one of the quote unquote unintended, but like incredibly foreseeable and obvious consequences of sesta fosta is that it criminalized harm reduction. So there was a lot of sex workers out there, full service, you know, criminalized sex workers exchanging information and publishing um, articles on the internet about how to engage in this work more safely, about how to mm-hmm. how to do harm reduction. And sesta fosta erased a lot of that content. Yeah, that was one of the biggest complaints I heard because mm-hmm. there was a place where sex workers could and, and call out abusive Johns and yes, say, like, absolutely. this man is dangerous, like, don't let him hire you. Yep. And, you know, I had this incident. Yep. Um, predators that's, that's really, yeah, predators really thrive under criminalization. You know, abusive, abusive pimps will threaten to use the police, will threaten to report people to, to ICE or immigration. Um, they're happy to use the state violence uh, to, to augment their control. Um, same thing with abusive clients. You know, Joey the player, uh, the count. I don't know how many serial killers uh, there have been that have targeted sex workers. Confident. Um, that the the fear of arrest um, is going to make it difficult to get law enforcement the information that they need to to protect the community from that kind of violence. Because again, you know, we would rather go after go after titties uh, than the violent exploitation of the vulnerable. Decriminalizing sex work is only one step um, in helping to sort of decarcerate America. But we, we have been, we've been violently arresting people and creating this sort of, you know, like ticking time bomb of, of social unrest, like putting people in cages is not a solution. And it's certainly not a solution, uh, to, for victims. Um, you know, I think the Robert Kraft case, uh, really illustrates this point, um, because there were five different press, uh, or I'm sorry, There were five different police departments in South Florida that threw themselves press conferences about the rescue operation that they had just 
execute this it. was the asian massage parlor. this yes this was the the asian massage parlors that were raided uh robert Kraft was the the highest profile um john or client um that they got but they they you know they publicly humiliated 200 men and they made a big show um after going after them but what they were more quiet about was the um multiple federal charges that they brought against every single woman they arrested uh they did not rescue um, sex slaves. They uh, saddled vulnerable immigrant but legally licensed uh, massage therapists in South Florida with the additional hurdle of having to deal with this arrest um, and criminal prosecution. And a lot of them have disappeared. Yeah, I remember that. That was a really shocking case. Well, that's the thing that I, I, I really want to point out to your listeners about this case is that the only unusual element was that somebody of Robert Kraft's uh, wealth and fame was involved. But this is what anti-trafficking raids look like in this country. It's not, uh, you know, good guy cops rescuing vulnerable people and then putting the bad guys in jail. You know, it's an egregious waste of taxpayer resources so that a bunch of guys can play cowboy and just end up arresting a bunch of uh, a bunch of women and targeting immigrant owned uh, businesses. That's what anti-trafficking raids look like. The story that they're trying to sell you, the story that the law enforcement departments tried uh, to double down on in the their press conferences are not an accurate reflection of the work that they're actually doing. And I think that, I mean, the clown show of what happened with the Robert Kraft case is a rare opportunity for us to see what these actually look like. But the execution itself is is not unusual. It happens all the time. Right. And, and where would you find that other side of the story, except for on like sex worker platform, sex worker right. advocacy platforms, right? Cause they're not running that story yeah, in the exactly. general paper. They're running the initial story of like, we saved all these yeah. sex workers because that's Absolutely. like what sells, you know, what doesn't mm-hmm. sell is like, oh, actually this was a totally bullshit raid. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's it. I think it's important to understand like this is how vice departments are funded. You know, there's a lot of money riding on the conflation of adult consensual sex work with trafficking, right? Because trafficking in the sex industry is actually incredibly rare and it is very difficult uh, to find police and prosecute. But you can just go out and find sex workers. That's like kind of our thing, right? We we advertise, we, we make ourselves um, accessible and available. And so if police departments are able to justify their quote unquote anti-trafficking quota by arresting a bunch of sex workers, they do that. Um, and that is increasingly what these uh, the anti-trafficking raids and vice departments look like. In fact, we're moving a lot of the tools uh, that were generated by the war on drugs and redirecting them at the adult industry, again, in the name of saving children from sexual exploitation. But if you look at the the results, at who these people are arresting and who is being charged with a crime, that's not what's happening. Yeah. All right. One last commercial break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about International Whores Day and we're going to talk about Caitlin's one woman show, Whores Eye View. Hang tight. We will be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies, they have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, They will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com, use code HOLLY, for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. Okay, guys, we are back. So International Whores Day, 
what is that about? That was June six, right? So that's Ju- June second. It is June second, and uh, that was June second. I'm really up on this information, and uh, see, I know what I'm talking about. I swear. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 so good. Uh, yeah, no, June June second um, is International Horse Day, and it commemorates the occupation of churches all over France uh, by sex workers and angry women who were there protesting police brutality. And they hung a banner from the Church of St. Nazir in Lyon, France, which is where this whole thing started, that read uh, in French, our children do not want their mothers in jail. Um, they got the inter- they got international attention. Simone de Beauvoir stood in solidarity with sex workers in France. They made they made headlines and they sparked the international sex worker rights movement that is still very much going on today. When was that? That was 1975, June 2nd, 1975. I was going to say, I got the June 2nd part. But yeah, 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 yeah. June 2nd, 1975, which is, which is interesting because that, that's the first, um, y- you know, th- that's the, the occupation and the medium moment um, and the, the, you know, the, the organizing efforts uh, behind that are what led to the current sex worker rights movement. That's very much our, our legacy. But the first sex worker led protest in the U.S., actually happened January 25th, 1917, where over 300 sex workers marched on a, a minister in a local moral moral reformer's home uh, to protest the imminent closure of their brothels and the criminalization of prostitution. And they said, if you want to help desperate mothers, don't close the brothels, give higher wages to women, which I think is still applicable today. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the sex industry is one of the very few industries where women make more money than men do. Yeah, that's true. So it makes sense to me why we keep trying to make it go away. (laughs) So you've got a show um, that just opened in New York. It's called Mm -hmm. A Whore's Eye View. Can you tell us a little bit about that show? Yeah, absolutely. It is um, is part history lecture, part stand-up special, and part one woman show and very, very personal story. But uh, basically, um, I take the audience on a mad dash through 10,000 years of human history from a sex worker's perspective. And we try to answer the question, um, how did this happen? Wow. I mean, the amount of knowledge that you've accumulated and the amount of knowledge that you have about the history of sex work is actually pretty astounding. I think that you might be the most knowledgeable on this subject of almost anybody I've had on this show. And I've had some pretty smart cookies <laughs> on this, on this podcast. It, this isn't saying that like you ever studied in school, right? Or is it, do you just I, I learn mean, all this yourself? I, I, I have a degree uh, in history from the college of Charleston and un, an undergraduate degree. And I did write my senior thesis on the economic structure of brothels uh, between 1890 and 1920, which is kind of a, a pivotal moment um in in feminist history right the lead up to to women's suffrage um and i but yes all of the rest of this is just the result um of an obsessive mind um i've been i've been obsessed with sex worker stories from for a very long time now um and i've i've sought them out over the course of years um and through the podcast um you know i've i've sort of developed this generalist sense of sex worker stories over time. You know, there are a lot of incredible historians um, and and scholars that whose work that I've I've leaned on over the years. But yeah, I'm if you're looking for somebody that knows a little bit about a lot uh, in this field, then I'm your person. So for anybody who's interested in learning more about the history of sex work, are there any particular books that you would recommend people check out or oh, you can't put me on the spot like I mean, yes yes there are so many but it, it yeah you got to tell me a time or a place or a specific you know like um 19th century 20th favorites. century india the u.s i i think the lost sisterhood uh which does a really good job of breaking down both the the rise and fall of overwhelmingly women-owned brothels um on the Western frontier and the incredible accumulation of wealth that was possible before, uh, before the suppression. 
um, of prostitution and taught uh, that. Yeah. So, so the lost sisterhood is a, is a really, really good piece um, specifically about American history and how sex workers were part of settling the West. Um, you know, Lou Graham uh, almost single-handedly funded uh, the, the Seattle public school system Um you know, she was a, a, a famous and, and well-known brothel in Seattle. And there are just so many of those examples of sex workers, not just thriving, uh, not just, um, you know, uh, winning, I guess, at the, at the game of capitalism, but specifically investing in their communities and and building real infrastructure um, in these frontier towns. You know, it was sex workers who, uh, you know, built a lot of irrigation systems, built public schools and sort of, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I can't, I don't have to read the lost sisterhood. It's great. That kind of leads me back to at the very beginning of the podcast. I, I asked you kind of a two part question, which I really realized was unfair because you were like, well, they both, which sure. one? <laughs> so I first asked you who your favorite figure, uh, sex history, sex worker um, was and their history. And then I said, or who is the most well-known? And you were like, ah, they're two different ones, but we never actually touched on the most well-known sex worker. Um, who would you say that was? And like, what is, why are they significant? I, you know, I think Marilyn Monroe, um, is maybe one of the most recognizable sex worker, uh, sex workers in, in our history, even if she is not, well known as a sex worker, although she was um, always very forthright about that that part of her history. Um, Sylvester Stallone, um, same story, uh, and I think Maya Angelou is another is another uh, prominent figure um, who engaged in sex work and was unapologetic uh, about her experience, writing about it extensively in in her second memoir. Wow. I actually didn't know about Maya Angelou. I know about the other two, but that's yeah. really interesting. Um, last question for you. If there's only one thing about sex workers that you could get the general public to understand, like what would it be? That sex workers are people and we have all, that we are already a part of your community. Love it. Caitlin, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating episode and thank you for sticking with me through the technical difficulties, which those of you who are (laughs) watching the final edited version on YouTube will have no idea about, but all my Patreon members (laughs) who get early exclusive access to the uncut (laughs) version will be able to see all the times I fucked up or the recording cut out. That was a team effort. We were, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) As long as we didn't lose the episode, because there was a second that we thought we were going to, and I almost cried. Uh, Caitlin, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Absolutely. You can see um, everything that I'm doing and that the whole team at Old Pro Productions is doing at oldproinc.com. I really encourage folks to sign up for our newsletter. If you want to be in the know like an old pro, we do a weekly roundup of sex work rights related uh, news from around the country in addition to all of the great stuff that we have happening at Old Pro Productions. Fantastic. Um, Do you have an Instagram or? Yes, Old Pro Inc. It's all Old Pro Inc. I-N-C. Great. Great. And you guys can find me at Instagram. No, at Holly Randall on Instagram. You know, I'm not going to get that out. I'm going to leave that in. I fucked up. I'm human people. I sometimes make mistakes. Uh, at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter, of course, to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Caitlin, thank you so much for one of the most fascinating history lessons I have ever had and um, you are just a wealth of information and such an interesting person and I'm actually going to start listening to your podcast oh thank you so much I really I uh, that means the world to me thank you so much I appreciate it and I um, can't wait to share horse eye view and it's uh, further along yes yes definitely interested to hear about that all right guys thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you 